The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. That, of course, is an excerpt from Steve Mnuchin's speech at CPAC this year. Uh, no, no, it's not. I'm just kidding. It's Gordon Gecko, who we thought was a fictional character. Oh, how naive we were. Uh, so we're going to be talking, however, not about Gordon Gecko, uh, not to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we are, in fact, going to be talking about a real live bank. Uh, specifically, our guest today is David Enrich, uh, the business investigations editor at The New York Times. His latest terrific book is Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump, and an Epic Trail of Destruction. Uh, David uh, rejected my alternative title, which was How to Corrupt a German Bank. Answer, let American bankers run it. Um, but uh, there are a lot of possible titles here, probably. First of all, David Enrich, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. So, you know, speaking of Gordon Gecko, I mean, we know via Matt Taibbi that Goldman Sachs is the vampire squid. We know from observation that J.P. Morgan was fined $13 billion uh, for uh, its activities in connection with the 2008 collapse. So we know that there are banks that are, in fact, pretty greedy. Why would we want to single out Deutsche Bank? What's different about it? Well, it's basically, I would say, the worst of the worst. And it is, you know, going back to its years of supporting the Nazi government in Germany, that really set it on a path of destruction that is more or less unparalleled in the world of modern finance today. And that goes right up to the present day where it is, you know, it's been at or near the center of just about every financial scandal under the sun. It is the primary financial enabler of Donald Trump, and I, and I would argue facilitated his rise uh, that culminated in him occupying the White House. And it, it's also the banker to men like Jeffrey Epstein. And th so this is a bank that had just utter disregard for morals, ethics, and often for the law. And so I, I see it really as a symbol of everything that ails modern finance and, frankly, everything that – a lot of what ails modern capitalism. Right. And, I mean, there are these uh, headline-grabbing names like Trump and Epstein, but, uh, I mean, Deutsche Bank also – violated sanctions against rogue states uh, like Iran, Burma, Syria, Libya, Sudan. Uh, they've laundered money for Russian oligarchs. I mean, this is kind of a multivitamin of, uh, of banking malfeasance. Yeah. I mean, there is a very, very, very long list of crimes that the bank has committed over the past couple of decades. And look, that's true for a lot of big banks to be fair to Deutsche Bank, but they, they have been deeply enmeshed in more, w way more than their fair share. And I, I, and I think to a greater extent than just about any other company in the world. And it's not an accident. It's a direct, I would say, predictable result of the way the company was being run with this obsessive, um, this obsessive focus really on just short-term profits above all else. And it fostered a culture in the company where envelope pushing was kind of a, an essential job requirement. And people were motivated and incentivized from the very top of the bank to go, go to whatever lengths necessary to enhance short-term profits. And often that involved violating the law. Um, I should first of all want to say that for people thinking about this book, and it's a book about a bank, and maybe you don't think you like to read books about banks, this book often reads like a thriller. Uh, and there are scenes that are like straight out of Olivia Pope. Not that I've ever actually watched that show. But I mean, there's a scene where uh, 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 one of the principal figures in the story has taken his life. And at one point, some thin guy shows up and takes some stuff off the computer and walks out and there's, who is that guy? We don't really know who that guy was. I mean, yep. there are sort of, there, there are ways in which uh, the stuff that you uncovered does play an awful lot more like a prime time or peak television drama than it does like the, bri the dry saga of bank regulation. 
Well, that's good. I, you know, I, one of my goals of this book was to write it in a way that it would appeal not just to the fairly small audience of people who really are dying to read a book about a random German bank, but that would really kind of capture people's imaginations a little bit and help them understand not just Trump and his finances, which obviously is a big part of the book, but also the world of modern finance that has this tendency, I think, to cloak itself in this veil of obscurity and jargon and complexity that really is, you know, it is complicated, but a lot of that is pretty self-serving because bankers and traders and people on Wall Street want to make it seem like everything they're doing is so incredibly important and so incredibly complicated that normal people couldn't possibly understand it. And that allows them to operate with a, a lot more impunity than I think they otherwise would. And it allows them to justify the really, I would say, unjustifiable amounts of money that they're often getting paid. Um, at the end of the book, one of the big reveals is that, uh, I mentioned this in the pre-news introduction, that Adam Schiff and Moby, the musician, are really good friends. I, don't, I think we're not even going to explain why that's important, or, uh, you know. but I, I think you have to read the book so you can understand why, or at least uh, get into the index or something. Uh, so I, I, I let's start here. Um, so... Uh, Donald Trump pre-presidency is a guy who's had one business failure after another and, and kind of specializes in defaulting on loans and stiffing creditors and screwing vendors. And at a certain point, as you document very well, nobody wants to lend to him. And he, he does things like he'll call up, you know, I guess it was at Bear Stearns where Ace Greenberg was his friend. And they like have to concoct these incredible stories about yeah, why they're... Is, yeah, go, why don't you tell that story? Well, yeah, this is just one of my the, my favorite anecdotes that I um, encountered while reporting reporting the book. Um, so the story goes like this. Back in, this is, I guess, in the mid-1990s, and Donald Trump has a good personal relationship with one of the top executives at Bear Stearns, a guy named Ace Greenberg. And so he has this great relationship, and he figures that that is going to put him in a great position to borrow a bunch of money from Bear Stearns. And so he calls up, Trump calls up uh, a pretty senior banker at Bear Stearns, and says, hey, I would like to borrow, I believe, it, I believe it was $100 million from Bear Stearns. And the banker knows full well, given Trump's well-documented track record of defaulting, that there's just no chance Bear Stearns is going to do that. But he nonetheless agrees to kind of take a look at the proposal in order to get Trump off his back. And he does. And, he, and Trump keeps calling him back over and over saying, hey, is there any progress on my loan application? And the banker figures that if he, retur- if he ignores Trump's phone calls for a long enough period, Trump will get the message and just stop calling him back. And Trump does not get the message and he keeps calling him back. And finally, Trump happens to have a breakfast uh, planned with Ace Greenberg. And at the breakfast, he complains to Ace that, you know, the banker is just not even giving him the courtesy of returning his phone call. And so Greenberg comes in to the office after breakfast and goes to the banker and says, why aren't you returning Donald Trump's phone calls? It's so rude of you. And the banker says, well, if I start, if I return his phone calls, I'm going to need to give him an answer on whether we're going to lend him $100 million. And Ace Greenberg says, well, we absolutely cannot do that. We're, he's the Donald. We're not lending him uh, anything. And so, and, and, and the banker says, uh, in essence, well, this is going to be a problem for us. And Ace says, well, fi- figure out a way to solve the problem. And so the banker thinks to himself about what to do and eventually calls Trump back and says, listen, Donald, I'm really sorry I've been returning your calls. That was really rude of me. My apologies. The reason I haven't been returning your calls is because we cannot lend you the money. And Trump says, why? And the banker says, well, Ace Greenberg says he doesn't want to. And Trump says, wait a minute. I, Ace and I are good friends. I just had breakfast with him this morning. And the banker says, well, that's exactly the point, Donald. Ace said that there are four people in the world who Bear Stearns does not want to be on the other side of a business transaction with. Henry Kravis, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Donald Trump. And so these are, you know, three of the world's great investors and then Trump. And Trump thinks to himself for a minute and the ploy just works perfectly. He says, you know, I can understand that. I can appreciate that. And so the banker manages to diffuse this potentially very ugly situation with Trump not getting what he wants by appealing to his sense of vanity. And Whoop. All right. Uh, so we just lost his Skype. We're going to get his Skype back. Um, so yeah, just very quickly, let me uh, let me finish out that story uh, on his behalf. So yeah, this this is sort of the lengths to which 
financial institutions would go to avoid. I mean, you know, basically, most of us, if we call up a bank and they don't want to lend us any money, uh, they'll tell us to go take a long walk off a short pier. Uh, in this case, they had to make up a story, and they flattered Trump by mentioning him in the same breath with three people who were solvent. Uh, and so it was to most of us hearing that sentence, Kravis, uh, Gates and Buffett and Trump, it's like, which one of these does not belong? Uh, but uh, for Trump, it was like, hey, yeah, those are those are the people that I belong with. So uh, we're talking, we should say right now, or we will be talking again, Skype willing, uh, with David Enrich, author of Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, uh, Donald Trump, and the Epic Trail of Destruction. And let me just say, as we get ready uh, to restore contact with David, <laughs> this is one of the things you have to do in the age of, of uh, Skype. You have to learn to vamp a little bit. You know, as we go through all this, we're going to talk about the specifics of Deutsche Bank. How did it turn into this kind of rogue institution? We're going to talk very specifically about the role that it played um, in, in, in taking a guy like Trump who, I mean, people who live in New York and pay a lot of attention to stuff, you know, heading into 2015, they were all saying, well, no, he doesn't, he's not a successful businessman. He doesn't really have anything. Uh, well, they actually enabled him uh, to kind of shed that reputation a little bit by, by keeping the cash uh, trickling in here. So one of the things I, I'm hoping to talk to David and Rich about when we get him back which I am confident we will do. I think I might even hear him. Uh, is, is I can hear you. Up. Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, so uh, we lost you right at the end of the Bear Stern story. But I, you know, it's funny. I've been listening to you, so I <laughs> I never lost you on oh, okay. my end. So. Okay, so you know that I've been raving like a maniac. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> it's been pretty impressive, actually. You've managed to keep it going. Yeah, uh, no, this is something you learn how to do. It's not, a, not an otherwise marketable <laughs> skill, but it, you, you learn how to do it. So let's just go back to this point. So Trump, we, you know, we told the Bear Stern story, Trump is not a guy anybody wants to do business with. How did, before we even get to their initial dealings with Trump, how did Deutsche Bank become the kind of institution that would consider doing business with a guy like Trump? So starting in the mid-1980s and certainly into well into the 1990s, Deutsche Bank decided that after many decades of being this kind of provincial lender to ger big German companies and European companies, it wanted to get a lot more prof profitable a lot faster. And the way to do that, looking around the world, was to really get into the business of investment banking and trading and essentially competing with the biggest Wall Street firms for the very lucrative business of you know, operating in the world's capital markets. And so Deutsche Bank started off in by the uh, mid-1990s hiring, it went on this epic hiring spree, hiring thousands and thousands of people from firms like Merrill Lynch and Bankers Trust and places like that and Lehman Brothers. And it spent billions of dollars doing that. And then the late 1990s, at the end of the decade, it spent $10 billion buying a huge US firm called Bankers Trust. And so all of a sudden, Deutsche Bank went from being essentially a non-entity on Wall Street to becoming one of the biggest, most aggressive, most risk-loving firms out there. And so by the late 1990s, when, uh, when they were trying to kind of elbow their way into the United States market, they needed to find clients. And the, one of the problems they had is that the, the wealthiest individuals and the wealthiest institutions in America in particular already had really good relationships with mainstream financial institutions. They were happy and there was therefore no reason for, a, for them to even consider doing business like, with a bank like Deutsche Bank. And so Deutsche Bank had to go looking for the scraps. One executive from that time period told me that basically they would go bo Deutsche Bank would go bottom fishing for kind of the rejects of Wall Street. And here comes Trump, who is off limits to the mainstream banking industry because uh, because of his well documented history of defaulting over and over again. And he's desperate to find a bank that's willing to get in bed with him because he wants to go from being this kind of second tier. Uh, casino developer to being one of the big builders in New York City. And so he approaches Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank's happy to do business with someone like him. And off we go. And hundreds of millions of dollars start flowing from Deutsche Bank to Donald Trump, enabling him to reinvent himself from being a failed casino developer to being one of the kind of splashiest, highest profile commercial real estate businessmen 
in the United States. It seems to me, reading your book, one of the things that I learned, uh, at least I think that I learned from uh, reading Dark Towers by David Enrich, our guest, this is Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump uh, and the epic, and, and epic tale of destruction. One of the things that I, I took away from it, but let me, you can tell me whether I'm getting it right or not. It seems to me that, you know, in any large bank, you have a, a bunch of people who are effectively driving uh, revenue for the bank by making loans. So they're essentially marketing loans. They're, that's their job. The bank's doing well if there's a lot of money in play. But there's also, in a big bank like this, risk assessment people and compliance people, people whose job it is to think about reasons why this might not be a good idea. And that one of the things that Deutsche Bank did, and I don't know how much the, how much more lopsidedly they did it than a lot of other banks, is to marginalize the second group of people, to, to have it be the case that their voices just didn't reach the level of amplification of the guys who were gung-ho about making, making the guys and women, I should say, significantly women, uh, ab- about making these loans. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. And those people, the people who had a tendency to say no or to raise questions or to be conservative were systematically silenced and in some cases punished throughout the bank over a long period of time. And this was a direct result of an edict that was issued by the bank's CEO in the early 2000s when he set these extremely high targets for the profits that the bank needed to achieve in a very short period of time. He essentially wanted profits to go up by about 500% in a two-year period. And look, there, and that's a that's a hard threshold to hit, but if you're going to try to hit it, it's obvious how you do it. You step on the gas in every single business that has a high profit margin, and you stop spending money on anything that is not absolutely 100% essential. And so one of the things that... And, it, and and that trickled down, it didn't trickle down, that that flooded down through the ranks of the bank. And so people who had long-term relationships with corporate customers, for example, that would, you know, every year earn the bank maybe 10%, those relationships were no, were no longer considered worthwhile because the new threshold was you needed kind of this 25% profitability target. And so there were This led to very rapid changes in the way the bank compensated people and the way people were incentivized to behave. And, you know, if you were kind of on the fence about whether a transaction was was good to do from an ethical or moral or legal standpoint, all of a sudden these new profitability targets really just pushed you over the line and you would say yes. And at the same time, things that were expensive for the bank to operate, for example, a compliance division or anti-money laundering staff that was highly trained and therefore had to be highly compensated. Those are really unpopular things to spend money on a Deutsche Bank because not only are they expensive and not only do they not bring in any revenue on their own, but in fact, they do the opposite. Their job, if they're doing it properly, is to say no to transactions and to shoot things down and delay things so that there's more attention paid to the soundness of the transactions and the safety of the transactions. And so Deutsche Bank did a really good job. They, they achieved these profitability milestones very quickly and then keep, kept going from there. And one of their great secrets to success was that they just did not care about the financial safety of what they were doing or the reputations of the clients that they were working with. So one of the more chilling examples, or maybe one of the more eye-catching examples that you cite of this, involves Kushner companies. So at a certain point, uh, I think it's not too long after uh, the Trump election, there uh, are some suspicious activities uh, involving the Kushner companies. It involves transfer of money from them to Russian individuals. One of these compliance officers whom you've just described notices that. Her name is Tammy McFadden. And this is sort of a no-brainer. I mean, for at least least for this initial suspicious activity report that this you reflexively do it it, it gets filed with FinCEN which is the uh, the kind of policing arm of the treasury department for this kind of thing and it should be noted, if you do that, if you're Deutsche Bank and you do that, you've kind of covered your ass, too. You kind of said, here's this thing, maybe nothing, m- probably is nothing, but it tripped one of our wires, uh, and so we're turning it over to you, and so done deal. Uh, it's off our desk now. <laughs> Except that what? They killed that before she could, uh, before even another set of eyes could look at it? Well, they killed it certainly before it could go to the federal government. And this was actually not after the election. This was in the summer of 2016. So not only right in the heart of the election, but right at the very time that the Russian government was interfering in the election to try and elect Donald Trump as president. So this was a a moment in history where 
the, in, uh, you know, this was publicly known at the time that the Russians were interfering in the election. And Tammy McFadden saw these transactions that struck her clearly as worthy of reporting as suspicious to the federal government. She did what employees are supposed to do in that situation, which is type up what's called a suspicious activity report. And normally it goes up through like a certain level of superiors at the bank. And, but that's kind of a rubber stamp process. Banks these days tend to err on the side of over-reporting, not under-reporting potentially su- suspicious transactions. And in this case, something very unusual happened, which is that her superiors said, nope, we don't think this is suspicious. We're not filing it. And McFadden was very uncomfortable about that decision, as well as some of the other things that she had seen when she was at the bank. And, you know, she did what employees are supposed to do in that situation, which is she complained and she flagged to her superiors that she was uncomfortable with the way this was being handled. She wondered whether this was something that was being done to protect the relationship with Trump and Kushner, who obviously were both, you know, very much in the news at that moment. And the more she complained, the angrier her her superiors got, and she was ultimately fired by the bank. Right. There was kind of even... Uh, it's, at least she felt there was a uh, an attempt to kind of marginalize her as, among other things, kind of a crazy black woman. Well, look, I mean, I can speak from my own personal experience. I've seen people at the bank do that mm-hmm. to her. They and they, when I started reporting on this back about a year ago, on, on, in particular on this Tammy McFadden episode, there was a real effort by the bank to just undermine her credibility and to cast her as yeah a crazy black woman. And she is a black woman, uh, but she's not crazy. And, and in fact, she has just extraordinary courage and, in speaking up and doing so publicly. And, you know, that's something that's very hard for people to do. And, I, you know, you don't – in my limited experience, you generally don't do that if you're making stuff up. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Nobody is going to go anywhere. You're not going to change your stations. Uh, David and Rich is not going to disappear. Everything is going to be fine when we get back, and we're going to tell you more stories about Deutsche Bank. Absolute control. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm juggling my iPad and this book here in a very awkward way. So uh, we're talking to David Enrich. He is the uh, author of Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, uh, Donald Trump, and an epic uh, trail of destruction. We have so many things I want to cover here, but no matter how much, many things I cover, we're not going to – I mean, you still have to read the book because it's really interesting. But, you know, this book – would have been, I think, less compelling without some of its more complicated figures, uh, some of the people who were, it were just a tale of villainy and malfeasance, and not a few heroes like Tammy McFadden. Uh, I, I don't know if it would have been interesting. And then there's this incredibly complicated char- uh, character whose name I probably don't know how to pronounce, Bill Brexmit. Uh, uh, so say, uh, tell us how to say Brooksman. that. Brooksmith. So tell us about this guy. This is a guy who's got one, one, one I guess he's got a black sock on one foot and a white sock on another kind of. <laughs> so Bill Brooksman is, uh, he's American. He was the son of a minister in rural Illinois. He, um, so he grew up not rich, not poor. Um, he became, he was a real kind of math whiz and became an expert in the banking industry in risk management and derivatives. And he was kind of a nerdy fellow. And he um, ended up going to Deutsche Bank in the mid 1990s, right as it was making this huge push onto Wall Street. And Brooksmith spent on and off the next 20 years or so at the bank and climbed up through the ranks and developed a reputation inside the bank as one of the rare voices of sanity, I would say. And he was someone who was, he had the knowledge and skills and also the internal reputation 
to be willing to say no to transactions and to be willing to push back when he felt like some of his colleagues were taking things too far or taking excessive risks or not paying enough attention to what regulators were saying. He was someone who really he practiced what he preached basically and was he became known internally as kind of the conscience of the bank and uh, he served as an ethical compass for a lot of people. And Brokesmith um, in January of 2014 was found hanging in his apartment in London. And so he committed suicide. And very shortly after that, I got in touch with Bill Brokesmith's son, Val, who became kind of this really fascinating character to watch as he tried to figure out why his father had decided to die. And I spent the next several years kind of trailing Val on and off as he went on this very elaborate quest to find answers and then ultimately seek vengeance against the bank. And one of the things he found out early on, he he got into his father's personal email accounts, his Yahoo and Gmail accounts, and he was in there looking for basically any signs of that maybe his father had a hidden life or the huge debts or another family or something like that to explain what had driven him to despair. And inst- he found nothing like that. Instead, what he found was that his father had been using his personal email accounts to send and receive thousands and thousands of Deutsche Bank emails. And so Val found in there not only correspondence between his father and senior executives at the bank, but also spreadsheets and meeting minutes and loan documents, stuff like that. And Val, who lived in London at the time, was a musician um, who had no training in finance, no experience. He, so this is basically like reading a bunch of stuff in Greek for him, and which is how I entered the picture. And mm. I helped him not only kind of translate some of these materials, but also to help him figure out what to look for because there was just the volume of stuff in his father's emails was completely overwhelming. And so it provides ultimately this extremely intimate unfiltered view inside this bank at a high level and watching not only – and Deutsche Bank at the time was already known as a bank with these really deep intractable problems and a lot of bad behavior. But this showed that not only were those problems even deeper than people had realized, but there was someone inside the bank at a senior level who was fighting to try and curb some of the excesses and get wrestle the bank back under control. And most of the time he ended up failing because he was just overwhelmed by a bank – that was that had a culture that was just hell bent on excess and really had no d- regard for ethics or the rule of law. And so Bill Brokesmith, as well as his son Val, become these really, I think, interesting vehicles to view the view kind of this horrible arc of Deutsche Bank through. And both of them are really complicated people, and they I've tried to kind of show them warts and all, which is not always pretty, but. Um, and Val has provided a real public service, I think, by helping get all of these documents in the public domain in a way that it really provides this extraordinary, very rare glimpse inside the upper echelons of power at a major financial institution. So we've already mentioned things like uh, loans to rogue nations and money laundering for a Russian oligarch. We've talked about failure to do due diligence and what would normally be a reporting requirement to uh, to Treasury investigators. But well, like beyond that, what maybe you could just quickly describe some of the things that, that wind up surfacing that were so troubling, were so excessive. In the emails. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is one of those things, you know, there's the expression of the banality of evil and, mm-hmm. and, and it kind of comes into play here because it's not, there's, it's not like we're seeing people committing crimes in real time. What, what we're seeing is this culture that evolves where it seems okay to kind of pull the wool over regulators' eyes or disregard concerns about, you know, you're doing a complicated transaction with another company in Europe and their brokesman raises concerns about, well, we're kind of, this is kind of slate of hands type stuff. Are we really sure we want to be doing this? What if it becomes public? Won't that really harm our reputation? And his concerns are just overruled. So, and I think the most vivid stuff comes in terms of the bank's interactions with federal regulators here in the United States. And Brooks has sat on the oversight board of a big kind of subsidiary of the bank in the U.S. that had really serious problems with the Fed. And it, Brooksman is over and over again counseling his colleagues 
to take much more seriously what the regulators are saying, try to address their concerns in a fundamental way rather than just trying to paper over problems. And you see his kind of his not really his temper, but his level of emotion rises on occasions where this is a guy who's very, everyone knows him as extremely cerebral and a really calm presence. And he's losing his patience because he feels like a lot of his colleagues are just being really cavalier and are trying so hard to maximize short-term revenues that they are really setting the institution up for a huge fall. And he was right. He didn't live to see it, but boy, he was really right. So um, one of the things that's probably worth mentioning here is that there, uh, well, actually, before I get to that, it does seem as though this shouldn't be possible. We think of banking as an industry that has probably the highest possible, the highest reporting requirements of any industry that I can think of, you know, and then there are sort of a lot of rules about what they can do and what they can't do. And ultimately, they're answerable to shareholders and, you know, all kinds of other stakeholders. So why does this stuff happen? Why, why could Deutsche Bank be the uh, the kind of rogue institution that it was? Well, I think on Wall Street in general, and what we've seen since the 2008 financial crisis is that while a lot of banks and other companies have been punished by regulators or prosecutors, there's been almost zero personal accountability for senior executives. And so what we've seen over and over again is that bank gets a big fine. It's embarrassing. There's some bad headlines. Maybe even the CEO or the CFO loses his or her job. But that's basically where the accountability ends. And so you do not have executives having legitimate deep concerns about whether they might be criminally prosecuted and go to jail. What we, you have instead are the, the, the risks, the personal risks borne by these executives is very limited. And, you know, it's just I think the way to deal with some of this is – and this is not just true at Deutsche Bank, although it certainly is true there – is when you – Humans respond to incentives, right? And if you're incentivized to take these huge risks and there's not a whole lot of downside, well, you're going to keep taking those huge risks. So you want to create some sort of healthy fear in executives that not only is their money on the line and their job security is on the line, because that really doesn't matter at the end of the day. These guys are getting so spectacularly rich over time that being fined $50 million even just is not going to be that bad for a lot of these guys. You need The thing that is scary – is really losing your reputation and potentially losing your freedom. And there are not that many people in the world who have the power to strike that kind of fear in the heart of bank executives, but criminal prosecutors are. And I think that a lot of behavior would change very quickly. And this isn't just on Wall Street either. This is a, throughout the corporate world. If banks or corporate CEOs had a real fear that if they mess up, in a serious way or their institutions mess up in a serious way, the consequences for that are going to be borne in part by them personally rather than just by shareholders and these kind of faceless institutions. All right, David, I just need you to be my therapist for a couple of seconds while I do another <laughs> primal scream. All right, so recently, within the last three or four days, um, Axios ran what it claimed was some names leaked by Biden's uh, close associates about possible staff members in a future Biden administration. And so you see some names that are kind of comforting, the idea of Ron Klain as chief of staff. I like that idea. But for Treasury, they, the names that were leaked were <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, one of the people who probably would support an awful lot of the things that you've just said that yeah. you know she, her fundamental argument is that these bad actors don't pay any personal price you know you can't have a system that works if they never do but one of the other names was Jamie Dimon was which was I mean pick a path Jamie Dimon CEO of JP Morgan when he got fined 13 billion dollars and still is CEO of JP Morgan and now is being touted as a possible Treasury secretary but I mean it's sort of like well they don't, they clearly don't have any strategy if they're try dithering between Elizabeth Warren, who probably would yeah, be the most punitive possible person, and one of the guys who does this stuff. Thank right. You. I mean, those are two very, uh, very different possible Treasury secretaries. In some ways, though, the job of Treasury secretary isn't what's important. It's the, what's important is the head of the Justice Department that mm -hmm. would have to would have a choice over how aggressively you want to instruct your prosecutors to go after crimes committed by institutions and how how personally you want to hold people accountable for that. And I, to me, that that is one of the great failures in, of, frankly, the Obama administration, right? They, they had the opportunity after the financial crisis to really come down hard on some of these people, and they just did not. And I think some of that 
is that these cases are hard to build and obviously everyone's innocent until proven guilty. But part of it is just an appetite. And there was a lack of appetite. There's much more focus on trying to preserve the integrity of the financial system and kind of repair and rebuild rather than holding people personally accountable. And I, I, I guess I can see that argument. But the consequence that we're seeing now, and I think this was pretty well anticipated at the time, was that you're, the, the only way to change behavior on Wall Street and in the corporate world is to change the incentives. And as long as the incentives are just completely lopsided toward rewarding aggressive behavior and that there's no downside to that, well, the behavior is just not going to change. And we're going to be surprised when in another couple of years, there's another huge scandal. And we're going to ask ourselves the same questions about why doesn't Wall Street's behavior change? And well, the reason is that there's no big downside at the tops of these institutions to change the cultures and change the incentives for people. All right. We're talking to David Enrich. Uh, his book is Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump, and an Epic Trail of Destruction. Still have a couple more topics I really want to uh, get to. One of them is the aforementioned Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, another is uh, the Supreme Court case that could materially affect our access to some of the relevant records about this stuff. So uh, let's take a break so we'll have time to get into both of those things. You bought a bitch. The whole nine yards. The shot of dreams. offering us a chance to short this pile of blocks. How? With something called a credit default swap. It's like insurance on the bond, and if it goes bust, you can make 10 to 1, even 20 to 1 return, and it's already slowly going bust. 10 to 1, 20 to 1? No way. And no one's paying attention. No one is paying attention because the banks are too busy getting paid obscene fees to sell these bonds. But wait, you are the bank. I mean, you work for the bank. I bet your margins are pretty nice and fat. Let's not talk about my margins, by the way. Being nice and fat. That's a nice shirt. Do they make it for men? Aren't you the bank? I work for the bank. I don't think like a bank. Big bank, small bank, I like to make money. All right? Let me put it this way. I'm standing in front of a burning house, and I'm offering you fire insurance on it. How can these underlying bonds be as bad as you say? It wouldn't be legal. <clears throat> Nobody knows what's in them. All right. Uh, that's, of course, uh, Ryan Gosling playing, I believe, actually a Deutsche Bank uh, officer uh, in the movie The Big Short. Uh, here with us, us is David Enrich, uh, author of Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, and Donald Trump, uh, and an epic trail of destruction. So, yeah, um, with the time that we have left, first of all, we've talked uh, quite a bit about uh, Donald Trump, but another big name here is uh, Jeffrey Epstein, although the reasons for getting involved with Jeffrey Epstein are kind of different, maybe even 180 degrees different from their reasons for getting involved with Donald Trump. I mean, as I understand it anyway, one of the reasons they liked Epstein was he did pay them back. Well, Epstein, look, the bank, Deutsche Bank was magnetically attracted to anyone that they could do business with that had a bunch of money. And often the time, often the types of people that they had access to were people who were essentially off limits to the rest of the banking world. And so Trump and Jeffrey Epstein had that in common. And Epstein was convicted of sex crimes in 2008. J.P. Morgan stuck with him um, as its bank, as his bank for f almost five years after that. But eventually, even J.P. Morgan got kind of cold feet and got disgusted with this guy because it was well known on Wall Street and elsewhere what Epstein was up to. And so they cut it, J.P. Morgan cut its ties with Epstein and Epstein needed another bank. He needed to borrow from a bank. He needed to have a bank manage his assets. He needed a bank to help him move money around the world. And, you know, you know where the story is going. Deutsche Bank goes where no other bank is willing to go and establishes a very fruitful relationship with Epstein that lasts, by the way, up until 
last the early last summer, right before he got arrested and charged with sex trafficking. So Epstein, in a lot of ways, I mean, everyone's I think rightly focused on Donald Trump. He is he's the president, but in a, in a lot of ways, the relationship with Epstein to me is almost more potent as a symbol of everything that's wrong with Deutsche Bank. And this is a guy who there was no argument, no good argument in favor of doing business with him from a moral or ethical or even a legal standpoint. This is something that was driven by pure greed at Deutsche Bank. And they didn't stop to think or didn't care that the 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 activity that they were facilitating was really bad for the world. And there were real human victims here. And they just tossed aside concerns like that, even as concerns like that were raised by the bank's compliance staff and anti-money laundering staff. So it's not like they didn't think of it. They did think of it and decided they didn't really care and would were happy to prioritize profits over everything else. So um, at the end of this month, uh, assuming that life goes on more or less as it has, although I think that's a pretty open question, but the, the, uh, at the end of this month, the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in the cases of Trump versus Mazars and Trump versus Deutsche Bank. Uh, there will be a decision, once again, if life goes on the way it normally does, uh, sometime between then and the fall, uh, so in time to materially uh, affect possibly the election in November. So this... This is a case where I think effectively Donald Trump is suing his own accountants so that they don't cooperate with probes. Do I have that more or less right? Yeah, that's more or less right. And so in about a year ago, uh, uh, three congressional committees issued subpoenas. One of them went to Trump's accounting firm. The other two went to Deutsche Bank. And the subpoenas sought Trump's tax returns, all of his financial records, his loan documents, and any internal records that the bank had related to things like money laundering concerns, stuff like that. And basically, as soon as the subpoena was issued, the Trump family sued Deutsche Bank and sued Mazars, his accounting firm, and basically suing them to block them from complying with these congressional subpoenas. And um, and those cases have now been winding their way through the federal court system ever since. And the, the outcome in these lower federal courts, both the district and appeal courts, have been unanimous, which is that Deutsche Bank and Mazars both do need to comply with the subpoenas. But the Trump family has appealed to the Supreme Court, which will be hearing oral arguments in a few weeks. And it, a decision is likely, I think, by June, in fact. And look, I mean, it's anyone's guess how the Supreme Court will rule, and I'm not in a good position to handicap that outcome. But if the court upholds all these lower court rulings, it will mean that Deutsche Bank will basically be complying with these subpoenas and handing over these reams of documents to congressional Democrats sometime over the summer, right in the heat of the presidential campaign. And Deutsche Bank has these materials compiled. They're ready to go. And so it's just a question of essentially hitting a button inside the bank when they're ready to send them over. And so this is – there's just – it's an enormous question before the bank and the White House what, what's going to happen here in the Supreme Court because Trump has been fighting tooth and nail to keep his financial secrets secret. And this – if the court rules against the Trump family, they will be in the hands of his bitter political enemies who I imagine – will make this stuff public sooner rather than later. Right. So there are various things that reporters like you have been trying to track down, even though this book is marvelously reported and documented. There's still like all kinds of mysteries here. Yep. Uh, I think there was a claim at one point that a, a Russian actor of some sort might be actually guaranteeing some of the Deutsche, like one of these big yep. questions, why would Deutsche be uh, loaning money to a guy like Trump who's not a, a good credit risk? Well, if there were somebody in Russia guaranteeing the loans, that would explain a lot. I assume that's the kind of thing you would like to know uh, that could conceivably emerge from this law- these lawsuits. Yeah, I mean that's one of about a zillion things that I want to know. I mean that I think that theory is based on like I've spoken to dozens and dozens of bank executives about this, and I have not heard any indications to suggest that it's that that particular rumor is true. But it might be, and I unfortunately lack subpoena power. So there's. Look, the answer to that could be in there. But I think there's a lot more stuff. That's kind of a long shot. And I think there is 
a lot more stuff that is much more likely to be very revealing about Trump's finances, where he's getting his money, what he's been doing with his money, his foreign business partners, concerns that employees had about him him or his family members or his businesses laundering money. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. And look, what we know, we don't know what it's going to reveal. We don't know how big or how damaging any of these secrets might be. But what we do know beyond any shadow of a doubt, is that Trump personally has been fighting extremely vigorously to keep this stuff secret. And that's not the behavior of a man who has nothing to hide here. And it it just isn't. If if there was nothing to see here, you would imagine he would have just put this controversy to, to rest a long time ago by releasing his tax returns and not engaging in a very expensive, very long term legal battle with these congressional committees. So I I think it's a safe bet that there's stuff in here that is not too good for him and that that's why he is fighting so hard to prevent it from coming out. You know, we only have about uh, two or three minutes left, uh, David Enrich, but we're having this conversation in the middle not only of coronavirus fears, but the market reacting convulsively uh, to coronavirus fears. And, and, you know, we've been through, I I remember at the time when a lot lot of the stuff about credit default swaps and derivatives were really coming out and the the average schmuck like me was beginning to sort of begin to understand this. And right in the middle of that, I I read about, I can't remember who was, I think it might have been Goldman Sachs, they were packaging up life insurance policies (laughs) as derivatives. Derivatives, uh, you know, I was thinking, what well, they have not learned anything. They have not learned any lesson whatsoever. They're just going to do all this stuff all over again. They're just going to do it with something else uh, instead of shaky Florida mortgages. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, are these kinds of underlying weaknesses things that you now worry about, knowing all the things that you know and seeing the stress and strain that's even less amenable to kind of tarp types of remediation? Yeah. Um, and, and because coronavirus is an irrational thing that doesn't want to obey any orders. Um, I don't know. What are you thinking right now? I mean, what I'm thinking right now is that there's a lot of fear out there. And I think the kind of trillion dollar question is probably ultimately how warranted those fears are and how much, if they're not that warranted, how much those fears just really result in real world damage to the economy. And I don't know the answer to any of these things. And there's, and no one does. And markets hate uncertainty. And there's just nothing but uncertainty right now. And people are scared. And I was, I'm, I'm in midtown Manhattan right now. And the streets are not deserted, but they are a lot emptier than usual. And it's very easy to see how that kind, those kind of, kind of individual behavior changes have a really significant effect on the overall economy. People aren't going to restaurants. People aren't going to Broadway shows. People aren't traveling. They're not going to conferences. They're canceling vacations. And it's very easy to see how this kind of snowballs into a pretty serious economic downturn, which is obviously bad news for everyone, including investors. But and for anyone who has a job or, and is looking to pay their bills, that is not good. The only winners here are people who are trying to refinance mortgages. So, All right. So uh, on that lovely and uplifting note, uh, we have to stop. <laughs> uh, but David Enrich is the author of Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump, and an Epic Trail of Destruction, uh, finance editor for The New York Times. And uh, that's a, it's been a terrific conversation. Thank you very much for having it. Thanks to Betsy Kaplan, our excellent uh, senior producer, uh, and Kat Pastor, who is weathering us. We're, we have stormy skies here. We're being buffeted by technological winds, but we managed to get the show done. So thanks, Kat. Thanks for doing that. Thanks to Gina Matruda for whatever he did, he did something. I can guarantee you that's one of the reasons we're still up here in the sky right now. And to Khalil Rahman, our intern as well. I'm still teaching at the high